Afloat with Henry Morgan. Afloat with Henry Morgan, written for radio by Warren Barry and a George Edwards production. Dolores discovers in time that Sir Thomas and Captain Morgan know her for an imposter, and she escapes from them, going with Dietz when he takes Kitty into hiding. Morgan thinks that perhaps Dolores might have gone to Geoffrey Hunter for help. So, together with Sir Thomas and Colonel Atterbury, he returns to the Flying Gull. There he discovers that Hunter is missing, together with the Aztec necklet, and not knowing the truth, believes Hunter has taken the necklet. When he learns that Kitty was seen wearing it in the Dolphin Tavern, he is convinced he is right. Meanwhile, Dietz has taken Kitty to a deserted stone hut overlooking the swamps and has left her in the care of Dolores. Looking from the small window, the two girls see Geoffrey Hunter being led in chains through the swamps. You have to let me go. You can't keep me here. I have to help him. I have to do something to save him. Oh, no. That is something I will not do. I do not care whether Diaz keeps you for himself or not, but I am concerned about my own safety. Do you think I'm going to let you return to Port Royal to tell the world of my hiding place? Look, the figures down there have almost disappeared. In a moment, they will be swallowed up by the green of the jungle. Although Jeffrey Hunter will not be so very far away from you, you will never see him again. Within a week, he will be dead. And within a week, you will be on your way with us. No, no, I must do something to help him. I must. <laughs> Jeffrey, Jeffrey, help! You little fool, keep quiet. There is no one who can come to your aid. Are you going to let Jeffrey Hunter go to his death? Why not? I have no further use for him. I got from him all the information I required. I don't care now what happens to him. How can you be so vile? You made love to him. You made him fall in love with you. He believed in you, and, and now you treat him like this. I do not blame myself for his present predicament. It was not I who informed the authority. No. No, then. I must be as vile as you are. But I've repented. Repentance will bring him no comfort. Oh, if only I could understand what all this means. I will tell you. It will help to fill in the boring time I have to spend here. It will pass a few of these dull moments, and I will tell you because I will enjoy telling you just how much you have helped the us and me in our plan. Oh. Ah, what a fool you have been. How gullible. But then, of course, your jealousy would make you like that, would it not? I don't think I want to hear any more. But you are going to. You are going to hear the full story. What made you think that a woman like you could hold the love of Jeffrey Hunter? You, a common, low woman. He only turned to you because he knew the type of woman you are. Whereas I am a woman of his own class. <laughs> it was so easy for me to take him away from you. So very easy. You must be the vilest person living. Oh, no. Unscrupulous. You must be to get what you want. Unfortunately, it was discovered that I am not Antoinette de Lacy. No doubt they fully believe me to be a Spanish spy, which is quite true. That is why I have come into hiding with you, to await the arrival of a ship to take us back. You will be found. You must be found. The truth must be told. Jeffrey Hunter must be saved from the fate he... We, we send him to he... Oh, we must be able to do something. We must... Even if I was found, nothing could be done to help him. He is an escaped convict. No matter what you do, Kitty, you cannot make amends for betrayal. You cruel, vile woman... You're torturing me with your words. I must find some amusement. I'll escape. I'll get to Captain Morgan. I'll tell him the truth. And he'll rush to save Jeffrey. How? The bonds which bind your hands will not be loosened. I will make sure of that. You will stay here with me until it is time for us to leave the island. And then your fate will be entirely in the hands of the earth. The jungle closes in with its green stillness broken only with the cry of distant birds. Vines chokingly twist and curl up and high around old, gnarled, moss-covered tree trunks. Sharp brown eyes of small furred monkeys peer inquisitively from behind the sheltering leaves. They chatter momentarily, still by their own curiosity. Giant flowers trail down from their vines like great splashes of paint flung from an artist's brush, which has been dipped upon a gaily-colored palette. But upon the ground, 
where the twisted roots dig deep into the earth is a carpet of rotting vegetation. Leaves turn brown with age and decay. The fallen flowers have lost their hue. Mud from seeping water mixes and churns it into a dark black mess from which comes the accurate stench of rot and decay. Occasionally the fallen leaves are disturbed as a scaled reptile with flashing forked tongue belly slides through the slime. Its cold, wicked eyes, age old with evil, unblinkingly search for the meal which must be full of life. The merciless sun sucks up into the heavens the moisture from the mud in a thin, steamy vapor, while just above the ground hang suspended by their overworked and tiny wings millions of death messengers carrying in their barbs the dreaded fever. The track through the jungle to the swamps is well worn by hundreds of feet that never made the return journey. Yet footsteps fall silently upon the putrid ground, as though the jungle resented man's intrusion. The small party of men who pass through this part are silent. All of them, except one, have made this trip many times before. They have no dark and brooding thoughts. They will have left this this portal to death long before the sun sinks into rest. This night they will once again enjoy the comfort of their women, the warmth of their drink. There's no novelty for them to be introducing a person to death. And the sweaty, sticky humidity makes talk too much of an effort. And the one who they know will not return, the one whose body they believe will in a week's time will be rotting in the swamp, his thoughts are not to be shared. They are his own deep and dark within his mind. They have no care as to what he thinks or feels, for in their minds he is already dead. But to himself, Jeffrey Hunter is far from dead. Providence has made it that hope dies slowly in a man's heart. Reason cries in his ears that hope must now be abandoned, but a spark of hope remains. I can't believe that everything has to end like this. To die forgotten, unknown, swamp. I have not lived this long to die like this. All through the remaining hours of darkness, Geoffrey Hunter had sat in the blackness of his cell. And when the first streak of dawn's greyness had etched itself in the sky, the guard, lantern in hand, had turned the grate and cumbersome lock, slid open the bolts and slammed back the door. My friends have come. You're going to release me? Like the surge of a great tide, confidence was within him. But the guard had opened wide his jaws and laughed. Sound had no humor, just cruel amusement. The tide of confidence went from Jeffrey Hunter. His chains were unlocked from the wall. Like a beast, he was taken out through the guardroom into the dull light of dawn. Three horsemen already mounted were there waiting for him. To them, Jeffrey Hunter had ceased to be a man. He was just an animal. An animal to be worked to death. Without showing any interest in him, the men talked together, laughed, shared a coarse jest. Then the horses were pulled into activity. The chains attached to Jeffrey's wrists were cruel. He jerked. A long whip curled around his shoulders and the small cavalcade moved out through the heavy iron gates, out into the roadway, with Jeffrey trailing behind the leader's horse, the other two horsemen following close behind. With a suddenness only seen in the tropics, the sun shot up into the sky, its rays burning up dawn's coolness. The road was rough and dusty. Iron manacles on wrists and ankles hung heavy on limbs and caused a stumbling foot. But a pace was made and the long curling whip hastened the lagging foot and still hope didn't die. Kitty must have repented. She must have. She would find Captain Morgan. She would tell him. He is my friend. Surely he will help me. He'll get me out of this trouble. Even now he's probably with the governor. Sir Thomas might be signing my release this moment. Before long more we will come riding on the road after us. But mile after mile, and no horseman overtook them. And the manacles hung more heavy on his limbs. His feet stumbled more often. Up a twisting, treacherous track on a hillside, the horsemen rode and Geoffrey toiled. Plantations and banana palms and green trees sprawled out over the hill, and the sea, studded with the sun's sparkling gems, spread blue into the distance. The summit was reached, and a halt was called, for the horses could go no further. While the men tended to the horse's needs, Geoffrey looked down into the jungle, the jungle which he was told was to be his grave. Everything seemed green, a deep, unhealthy green, with mists coming up through the greenness, and in the center of this sea of green was a dark brown patch which shone on the sun, the dreaded swamp, 
the draining of which was being paid for by men's lives. Slowly the descent was made and the men, just like pygmies in the vastness of the jungle, but hope was still alive with just a faint flame in Jeffrey. And once he could have sworn he heard Kitty's voice. But that, of course, was silly. Was not Kitty back in Port Royal seeking aid for him? The cry was the cry of birds, the chatter of a distant monkey. And now the journey is almost over. Now and again through the trees can be seen the swamps, muddy waters and rough crude stone huts which house the convicts for so short a time. Meanwhile, in Port Royal, time creeps on and Sir Thomas and Colonel Atterbury wait for Henry Morgan to leave the Dolphin Tavern and join them. Ah, here comes Morgan now. And look at his face, black as a thundercloud. Well, Morgan, what did you find out about the girl? Gone. All alone. Hasn't been seen since this morning. But she can't do that. She's a bonded servant. Well, and she's taken her life and liberty into her hands and flown with that scoundrel hunter. Do you think the three of them have gone off together? The three of them? Uh, yes, of course. Now, that's strange. How do you mean? Without doubt, Hunter took the necklet and gave it to Kitty. The woman we thought to be Antoinette de Lacey learned that she was about to be unmasked and fled. Because of the feeling between that woman and Hunter, I feel sure that she would have gone to him. And yet Hunter gave the necklet to Kitty, and not to that woman. We know that they must have all gone off together. It all adds up, and yet it doesn't make sense. Little does Morgan know that he has within his grasp the truth of what really happened. Will he realize it? Make sure you listen to the next episode of Afloat with Henry Morgan. Henry Morgan.